If I remember correctly, somebody asked uh, that we spend a little bit of time, again, trying to uh, put things together. And it was in that context that uh, I attempted to put together a summary of the things that we have covered. And then I thought in discussion, uh, I would try to go through a number of them uh, from the standpoint of looking at one of the companies that you've become a little bit familiar with because of these, uh, these projects that you've been working on. Uh, figuring that would be a good background for application so that you can hopefully see how all of them have to be applied and also a little bit about in what order do you apply them. So I'd like to take a little bit of time and please, as we go through, uh, you know, open up your mouth and ask questions or comments or whatever, uh, because the idea is that you want to be able to see the big picture as to where things get applied. And again, to some extent, the order of application. Now, I figured that probably, um, I mean, pretty much all of the companies that you have worked on, all of the six companies, would be good examples. But at least I pulled out of the air, uh, I think, the Apple one as being, in my mind, a pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good one that's relatively simple in structure and uh, pretty easily understandable. Uh, with that in mind, let's go to document camera here and, of course, attempt to draw uh, what does Apple look like. We have some number of companies which are part of what I'll call the US group. We have uh, AOI, which is the Irish uh, non-resident uh, holding company. And then we have, of course, a bunch of other companies now they may actually, in reality, of course, be another company and then subsidiaries under that. But for our purposes here, this, this uh, uh, picture is certainly good enough. There are, of course, some of these subsidiaries which uh, are in Ireland. But there are other subsidiaries which might be in Singapore, might be in France, might be in the UK, might be in Russia. I mean, they can be anywhere. This is our basic picture. I had sent you that, uh, that outline. And that outline uh, which I put together is the subjects which we have been covering this, this quarter. There's a few other things that uh, I realized afterwards I should have added. And that's some of the subjects that you covered last quarter in T515. And assuming I can find uh, a little bit of time, since I am <clears throat> retired, I expect that I will find some time to do it. Uh, I will attempt to add to what I sent you and then send you a new one uh, so that I add on some of the, uh, uh, some of the additional uh, uh, topics that you would have covered last quarter as well. Now, what was the first item on that, that listing that I had sent? OK, entity classification. Uh, why did I choose that first? Any ideas? You got to start with the box. Yeah, you have to start with which boxes are real boxes and which ones are make-believe boxes, so to speak, from a US tax perspective. Again, we're talking and focusing primarily on United States taxes as opposed to the taxes of the countries in which Apple actually conducts operations. If we were doing a broader review and broader investigation, we would have to uh, bring them into the picture as well. But since we're narrowing our focus uh, I suppose with blinders, you could say. Uh, you could say we 
uh, want to start with the U.S. entity classification rules. What has, what has Apple done uh, in this regard? Apple for AOI accepted that yes, it is a C Corp, treated as a C Corp. Now, did it actually have to make an, an active election under the, uh, the entity classification rules, or was it just by default treated as a corporation? Okay, well, uh, AOI f for Irish purposes is a real corporation. Yeah, it's not a reverse hybrid. This is, uh, anyway, AOI, yeah, definitely a real corporation formed under Irish law. Uh, now, admittedly, their management and control is outside of Ireland, and as a result, it's not tax resident in Ireland, but it is an Irish company respected by Ireland. Okay, why am I asking about whether, uh, whether Apple had to make for AOI either an active election or did not have to? Um, because if it isn't a per se corp under the check the box rules, then they don't make an election, they're a partnership, and if they, they do make an election, they can- See, if you, had your, if you had your code here I would, and, and regulations, I would tell you to look at them. Yes. There are, what you're bringing up is very good. There is in uh, 301.7701-3B, as in boy, there are two paragraphs. There may be more paragraphs, but there are two important paragraphs. One is for domestic eligible entities, and one is for foreign eligible entities. There are different rules. Yes, if we were talking about a Washington State LLC or a Delaware LLC, what you said is absolutely correct. Oh, right, for the foreign, they have, um, someone has to have unlimited liability for it to be a partnership. Exactly. So there's this default rule. If you have a domestic LLC, then it's just automatically unless there's an active election to the contrary, there's just this default election as to be treated as either a partnership or a disregarded entity. But for foreign entities, the rule is different. And as a result, for AOI, which is an Irish company, foreign eligible entity, if there's no election made, it's treated as a corporation. So as a result, when we apply the entity classification rules and we look to see what Apple did or did not do, they, for AOI, were told that they treated it under these rules as a corporation. So AOI is the controlled foreign corporation, the CFC, under the subpart F rules. So if one person did have unlimited liability, then it would be a per se well, not, not per se, uh, don't use the word default. per se. It It'd would, be a default. It, by default, it would be a partnership. Okay. But under the foreign rules, if it is a limited liability. If it has limited liability. It can elect to be a partnership, can it? Well, it, it could, sure. If, even if no one has unlimited liability? Yes. I mean, that's what the check the box rules are. You have your choice. Oh, unless it's a. Okay. But it's not a per se corporation because in Ireland it has to be a PLC and this is not a PLC. Right? Okay. And I thought if no one had unlimited liability, then it's a per se association. No. 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 Okay. Uh, absolutely not. Okay. Uh, I, again, these, these particular sections in the regulations are very, very short. And they're very, very important. You know, take the five minutes and read through them to see what's there. I, I know that's one of the, that's one of the joys in life. You can read it again and again and again. Yes. Okay. So if it is not a per se foreign corporation in that giant list, then it's an eligible entity. And it has no one has unlimited liability. It can still elect to be a partnership. 
Yeah, as long as something is an eligible entity, which means it's not a per se corporation, right. then case. you have a choice. Okay. The, you know, the fact that there's limited or unlimited okay. liability just does not make a difference except within whether the default rule gives you one answer or the other. Uh, we then look, of course, underneath AOI, and we have all of these entities, which we'll assume are limited liability companies or, or some, uh, some form of limited liability company in all these countries around the world. Our understanding, of course, is that Apple has caused active elections to be filed so that all of these are either disregarded entities or partnerships if they have more than one owner. We understand or at least believe that they're all disregarded entities because there's only one owner as opposed to two. So if you're in Singapore with that Singapore box, would Singapore look differently on that box? As far as Singapore is concerned, that is a validly formed Singapore company which has employees, which can they go to the local it. court. Yeah. And they don't look at it as a disregarded entity. They look at it as a company. So if, if you like have a, a mix and match here, if you will, like Singapore says, you're a corporation because you're in Singapore and you're looking corporate, corporate like you're looking corporate-ish, um, and we're going to give you um, certain tax benefits for that or certain tax. But the U.S. is over here saying, you're a disregarded entity, and so we're... You're just a branch of an Irish company. So then is there sort of a play in terms of the rules, the sort of benefits and the burdens kind of? Okay. So when you say that is there a play, I mean, absolutely, because a lot of these... Uh, in a sense, structures that have been created and which you know you've looked at in you know in some of the uh, the work you're doing on the the project assignment uh, is that yes, they are playing these things off against each other. You know, stepping in ahead a little bit, but we know that Apple set this thing up to effectively sidestep subpart F to be able to say that. Gee, we get you know we uh, we acquire our inventory from Chinese manufacturers, contract manufacturers. We sell it to unrelated third parties, and because this is treated as just one company, AOI, which is doing all these manufacturing and sales functions in theory, uh, we're sidestepping subpart F. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, to finish off your point, uh, well, uh, gee, how much should be taxable in Singapore? Well, within that box, they have certain functions. And they will be paid something, and we'll eventually get to it, the transfer pricing rules. They will be paid something to the Singapore company, presumably by the Irish company, one of the Irish companies, so that uh, from a Singapore perspective, Singapore sees a Singapore company, sees employees doing something, sees intercompany agreements, for example, a service agreement between the Singapore company and one of the Irish companies. And under that service agreement, the Singapore company is getting paid an arm's length remuneration for what it made. So Singapore is happy. They tax on that amount, and everybody lives happily ever after. Is there any push to get a uniform um, uh, international agreement on different uh, entity categories and definitions? Uh, like that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, actually, that's actually a very good question. Uh, I am not aware of anything. There are lots of things going on right now. And in fact, just this past month, the OECD came out with a, uh, a new discussion draft on uh, how the inclusive framework, which is roughly uh, about 125 countries that are 
uh, working together within the OECD BEPS project that's you know, continued on after its initial in several years, uh, how they should uh, deal with and uh, try to harmonize, in a sense, rules to prevent multinationals from, I, I don't know what other expression to use, to keep them from getting away with murder on not paying taxes anywhere. Uh, I mean, I've been involved the last, uh, last week or so in making some comments on these for an organization that I'm part of. So, yeah, there's these things going on. Have I seen anything in the way of internationally uh, dealing with this? Not from the standpoint of, uh, gee, both Singapore and the U.S. should treat the entity the same way. Instead, uh, one of the BEPS action points was how to deal with hybrid entities and hybrid transactions. The final report on that is 300 pages. Uh, what one of the manifestations of that is uh, your, uh, uh, a few of the anti-hybrid things which got into the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, I hope to cover one or two of those things, uh, uh, but uh, so far there hasn't been, uh, been time. There's not something which goes to the heart of it and says, okay, gee, force countries to treat you know, the, 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 an entity in the same way. There's nothing like that. But when there is this hybrid situation, then there's this terribly complicated stuff as to how do we deal with it in order to prevent the, of course, mismatches which uh, easily occur. Uh, were you going to say something, Kanat, or are you just waving your arm? No, I'm just... Okay. <laughs> so with country by country reporting change, um, I guess, you know, would it change this idea of a disregarded entity? It's not going to change. It's not gonna no, it won't. No, the, the country, okay, what you're referring to, country by country reporting, one of the things that came out of the BEPS project uh, when this was, uh, I think, action point 13, uh, is the requirement that all countries uh, require their multinationals to create certain country-by-country -country information, and then it can be disseminated to other tax authorities around the world. The focus of this has been primarily from the standpoint of uh, allowing local tax authorities the ability to at least look at some information, how many employees, how much profit, how much uh, you know, other you know, uh, disclosed things by location, in order to, in a sense, look at something and say, gee, I think that I should audit this more closely so that I can see whether there's a big transfer pricing problem. Uh, the idea was not that uh, tax authorities would be able to look at this and just with this country by country information, you know, actually just assess and grab more, more profit, uh, more taxes. Uh, the idea is it's something that the local tax authority can use to assess risk. Uh, you know, how much risk is there that this taxpayer has really been pushing the envelope? And I should spend my limited resources to go after it. Okay, so uh, I think probably at this point we've, uh, uh, we've beaten the, uh, the first topic uh, sufficiently. What was the next topic on that listing? Once we know where there are boxes and where there are not boxes, and we've, and again, we're looking at this from a, this analysis from a, uh, a US perspective. So now we can, uh, to use, a, what was it, Darcy's uh, term of art, we can now say this is the blob. Kids be known for something so <laughs> Can we just watch the blob?
you didn't realize that you would uh, be remembered by posterity for something. I hope posterity is not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we hope you have more longevity than that. Although this class might be catching me. I <laughs> know uh, that's uh, that's good to hear. Okay, so what do we mean by uh, by judicial doctrines? Uh, you know, recharacterization. Uh, now, we've determined that there are, for U.S. tax purposes, two taxpayers. We have Apple at the top and we have AOI with its operations being carried out through locations all around the world. Is each of them a principle in its own right? Are Apple and AOI, in a sense, equals? Are they both taxpayers where we should respect them, respect the agreements they have between them? respect the way they characterize their operations? Uh, do you think that AOI really is able to uh, manage its own destiny with its own people? So how do we look at this? Uh, if, we were, uh, if we were going to, uh, and this is something which would probably cause most of us to get nauseous, but you know, if we were to read a bunch of cases on substance versus form and uh, patients you're getting nauseous just uh, my talking about it. Uh, if you know if we look at those things what would a court look at would a court look at only the documents or would a court look at well you know who's doing what and where are they doing it and who actually drives the car what we're looking at in a judicial analysis of uh, substance versus form or assignment of income, we're looking to, you know, again, who is doing what, where are they doing it, who's making decisions, and so on. And one of the rather important things, does AOI, in fact, have the people, or in your case, Facebook uh, Ireland, does it, in fact, have the people, directors, uh, officers, employees, who in fact can, you know, are capable of running its own business, capable of, in fact, being able to enter into the contracts which it enters into? Or are the people who are really doing that back at the parent and are not within this blob which you have so articulately uh, labeled. On the surface, we look at the Apple situation and we say, well, gee, we know that, you know that AOI has no employees itself. It has employees through all of its disregarded entity subsidiaries. Since we do treat this as a blob, it really doesn't matter whether a person is down in one of the subsidiaries or at the AOI level. But to, uh, to look at it, at the director of AOI level, I think uh, if I remember correctly what uh, uh, one of you said in your presentation was that uh, there are three directors. Two of them are executives of, <clears throat> uh, executives of uh, uh, Apple Inc who wear a second hat as directors of uh, AOI. And then there's a third one, which is uh, somebody who is actually living and working in Ireland. Generally, most of the people who have held director responsibility are either from the legal, treasury, internal accounting functions. They are not, for the most part, operating management. Now, I do recall for a few years, Tim Cook, who is the CEO of the company now, was a director of one or more of these companies. But for the most part, they're not operating people. They're legal or financial uh, people. Uh, now, let's look at the, the employees down in the, the companies. Do they have? the knowledge and ability to 
uh, in fact, uh, manage the contracts with suppliers, with the contract manufacturers? Probably not. Is there anybody within those subsidiaries who actually has real, uh, in fact, operating control over the worldwide business of AOI? There's certainly going to be somebody who has responsibility for France. There's certainly somebody who's going to have responsibility for the manufacturing operations, which in fact are taking place in Ireland. There are some limited, uh, as we call, specialty computers that are being manufactured there. But is there somebody who actually uh, has the capabilities and the authority to manage all of AOI's business as a, a CEO of that company? Probably not. We don't know that for sure, but I say probably not. So uh, although uh, it doesn't appear that Apple has ever been questioned by the IRS on this, there at least is a question that you have to ask, is AOI, is that blob, a principle acting for itself, or should it be seen as, in essence, an agent carrying out the directions of its principal, which is Apple Inc.? Now, I think a few of you uh, worked on the Caterpillar, uh, uh, the Caterpillar uh, uh, company as a, as a project. And uh, you would have seen in the, uh, uh, in the footnote, the, the, the income taxes footnote to the financial statements that the IRS is questioning Caterpillar on uh, whether, in fact, the Swiss structure is itself a principle that should be respected as such, that earns its own income as a principle in its own right. Or, on the other hand, is it a mere instrumentality of uh, the U.S. company acting effectively as an agent, and therefore the income that is that was booked within, that was reported within uh, CSRO, the Swiss, uh, Swiss company, should that actually be income which is treated as income of the U.S. parent? To sort of summarize first, we looked at this and said, okay, where do we have boxes under, under the entity classification rules? And then secondly, we have to apply judicial concepts, which are basically, do we respect or do we not respect the contracts that the taxpayer has entered into? Okay, there's one more thing I'd like to uh, I, I think get across, which might be uh, might be useful. Let's digress for a moment, and let's draw a different picture. So I can. Let's say that we have A, and A has two subsidiaries B and C, and let's say that B is a uh, is manufacturing. And let's say that C over here is doing sales. And that, of course, what C sells are the goods that B manufactures. Now, I've just told you what they do. I have not said anything about how they are contracting with each other from a planning standpoint as opposed to looking at history, in other words, in looking at this Apple or Caterpillar or Facebook situation, we're looking at history and we're trying to analyze it a bit. But from a planning situation, if you know that a company B, let's say in one country, is going to be doing the manufacturing and there's another company C which in another country that is going to be doing the sales, what are the possible contractual relationships between them? Go ahead. Cost plus for the sales? You're talking transfer pricing. I'm not talking transfer pricing yet. We haven't even gotten to transfer <laughs> pricing yet. On, 
on our uh, listing of things. Okay, so go back to the, uh, the second one on the list. But before we can characterize what they do, uh, we need to know what, uh, what contractual relationships, uh, in other words, we want to know whether, uh, let me step back a moment. If we're the tax authority, we want to look at the contractual relationships and think, do we respect those contractual relationships? or do we not respect them because there's a form versus substance problem or an assignment of income problem or some other judicial concept? Well, we're, lo we're looking, you're getting to the right thing. We're looking at what are the possible, again, we're now planning for the future. What are the possible contractual relationships that there could be? We know that B's manufacturing the goods, C is selling them. What are the possible contractual relationships? We could be that C is, B and C sign a distribution agreement, and under that agreement, B will sell, sell product to C, and then C resells it to the customers. Now, so that's one possibility. B sells to C, C resells. Okay, so distribution agreement. What's another possibility? Uh, yes, Logan. It could be a sales agent where B retains the title of the goods until they get Excellent. Okay, so in that case, let's use a different color. In that case, B sells to the customers. There's, instead of a distribution agreement, we now have an agent agreement, agency agreement. And B pays a commission to C for the services rendered. Uh, yes? B could be the supplier in which C is contracting them to manufacture. Absolutely. So C could be making the sales, but enters into a contract manufacturing agreement with B. So is this implying that B or C or whatever, is the diagram implying that those boxes are exclusive to A, have an exclusive relationship to A? Well, I put A at the top to show that they were commonly owned. The point is when you have commonly controlled taxpayers, you can do whatever you want in terms of how you characterize their relationship from a planning perspective. You have the ability to define those relationships. How is that different than a related party? Well, it's the same, same. I'm, same. Okay. Yeah, I'm saying A, can, A is the, again, for simplicity, A owns 100% of okay. B and C. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear yeah. from the start. Yes? Sir, are we still trying to answer which one is the principal, or are we going? Well, we're not trying to answer it. What I'm trying to do by saying, from a planning perspective as opposed to a historical perspective, you have the choice. Now, why might one be good or bad in particular situations? Let's assume that your country of manufacture is a high tax country, relatively speaking, and that the country where the sales are being made is, relatively speaking, a low-tax country. Now, one of you, uh, I don't remember which one, was you know, brought up, you know, cost plus. plus okay. <laughs> okay, so in the case of B uh, being in a country that's high tax, well, gee, I want to minimize, to the extent I can, the amount of income in B and maximize the amount of income in C. 
what might I do in the contract between uh, B and C, this contract manufacturing uh, contract? Well, uh, gee, what might some of those terms be? Who's going to take the risk of uh, how much inventory uh, is produced and the risk of whether we can sell that inventory? What do you think, Josh? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think A is going to take that, right? Pardon? A is going to take that risk because they probably have No, no, A is, A is only the owner up here. It is not contractually involved. Economically, you're absolutely right. Economically, but we are in a tax area. We respect the legal entity. We don't consider economic things like the fact that A is, you know, economically going to bear it. Let's assume that we have decided that we want to minimize the amount of taxable income in B and maximize the amount of income in tax in, in C. So and yes, if there were a personal property tax on inventory uh, in, in, in B, then that would be another reason to avoid having high inventory in, in country B. Well, the, the issue is what is the percentage of that plus? When we get to transfer pricing, we're talking about value. We're talking about, well, what terms of an agreement will push value one way or the other? So we just said, uh, we brought up the example of which one of the two parties should be bearing the risk of holding inventory. Now, what, what is the risk of holding inventory? What it is it? Sell. Yeah, it, it might not sell. sell. And if it doesn't sell, you know, you have to take a loss. Do big companies ever make too many iPhones and have to dump them? Yeah, and they occasionally, uh, they occasionally take write-offs for those things. Okay, so the question is, what is the, what is the alternative to high risk? If you have high risk, you are hoping for high, high revenue, high profit. If you, if you were to loan money to Josh, I think she just insulted you. If she were to. If she, now, you obviously think of Josh as a high-risk borrower. <laughs> Assuming you did decide that you would extend credit risk to him, you would loan him 100. Would you ask for only 1% of interest, or might you ask him for the highest you can under the local usury laws? The highest I can. The collateral. Yeah, so the point is, if, you ex if you're a taxpayer that is accepting more risk, you are expecting higher profit. Now, you know that higher profit might not eventuate, but the point is, transfer pricing says that if you're accepting higher risk, then the price you're charging should reflect that higher risk because it reflects the higher expected profit. So going back to our inventory, just the inventory, where the risk is, it will become unusable and unsaleable. Right, so if we want to minimize income in B, mm -hmm. maximize income in C, and of course, does your average businessman really think he's going to be left with a stock of unsold iPhones? I beg your pardon? Because if they're smart, they're, they're going to have a circle. <laughs> How many businessmen have you met who really believe they will not sell all that they have, all that they can produce? You would write into that contract manufacturing agreement that B will manufacture a certain level of you know of inventory you know a hundred thousand units, and they get paid for it no matter whether those units are sold by C or not. 
C is taking the risk. And that justifies a lower percentage on that cost plus that you so know and love. Okay, what other, you know, what's one or two other risks? Okay, uh, gee, who bears the advertising costs when C is trying to sell to the customers? Does B or C bear the advertising costs? C, yeah, absolutely. Because advertising costs, you know, maybe we'll sell more, maybe we won't. And that's a risk that C is taking by spending money on advertising. Uh, is that much more wiser? They share the cost of, uh, of commercial, then B gonna just generate more loss and are just deficit their what is wiser mm -hmm. uh, is not part of this analysis. <laughs> we know, as somebody was pointing out, that you know A is the one who's really economically at risk. Mm -hmm. But in our tax analysis, we're only looking at B and C. And we've decided that because the country that B is in has a high effective tax rate and the country that C is in has a low effective tax rate. We've decided that we want to have a contract between the two that justifies having a low markup, a low profit level within B, and higher risk and higher potential reward in C. I, I seem to remember that in the uh, slides for the transfer pricing uh, in this kind of let's say, distribution agreement or other agreement, uh, there's a whole listing of terms like these that could go one way or the other. And the point is, in a controlled situation, to use the uh, word you prefer, Darcy, which is related party, in a related party situation, you can put in whatever you want, whatever economically justifies. Getting back to the characterization, uh, if all the people who are really controlling those risks are employed by B, and we are putting all that risk contractually in C. Well, now maybe we have a, you know, a character. <laughs> you know, how, how should we characterize this? Is, does the contract really match the substance of what's there. If all the real people making the decisions on how much inventory to make are there in, in B, uh, for example, to whom should we uh, extend credit risk, things like that. If all those people are in B, then maybe we have a recharacterization uh, potential problem. Anyway, again, just to summarize, the point I was trying to make here is that when you're in a planning mode as opposed to looking at history and saying what are the risks uh, or you know, what, uh, what could the IRS or what could foreign tax authorities do to what we have done historically. In this planning situation, you are in the driver's seat. You look at the actual activities that are going to be conducted, and then you can construct whatever contractual arrangement there is that will achieve the best tax answer, while at the same time reasonably adhering to what the substance is. In other words, maybe you would not be uh, you wouldn't want to be as greedy if all of those people or most of those people are over here in B. You might not want to be quite so greedy in minimizing the income within, within B. Okay, what was the uh, next one on that listing? Okay, so the transfer pricing. If we look at this, we haven't drawn anything between Apple Inc. and the blob. What do we know, though, despite the fact that we haven't drawn it, 
what do we know is there in terms of transactions between Apple and the AOI blob? You probably got to shift to the intellectual property, intangible property that you shifted, right? Right. Okay. So one thing is the cost sharing agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, in Apple's case, they started this, I think, back in 1980, uh, and this has been going on forever. So whatever the buy-in that was in 1980, and I don't think they, uh, my guess is they probably didn't uh, really think about a buy-in back at that point. Uh, things were a lot smaller, I think, back then. But uh, certainly if we were looking at something uh, that was a little more recent than 1980, whether it's uh, Facebook with their situation or Microsoft with its situation, there's a question on what the buy-in should be for the acquisition of the IP. So buy-in of IP. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, what else is there? What's the other part of a cost-sharing agreement? Let's uh, attempt to make uh, one other thing clear. When we have two parties, A and B, and A starts out with all the IP, and A wants to allow B to have use of some or all of that IP. Okay, how can it get uh, use to that of that IP to be? Now again, just like we talked about with the A, B, and C, and we said B was doing manufacturing and C was doing distribution, uh, we're looking at, uh, in a sense, right now, function. Okay, uh, A has IP, it owns that. It wants B to have the use of it. And now we're talking about what mechanism, just as we were saying, keep putting your arm up, just as we were saying before, okay, it could be a distribution agreement, it could be an agency agreement, it could be, you know, whatever. So what are the choices for A to get the use of the IP to B? Licensing and buy-in. Oh, well, just a second. Are you saying licensing buy-in as there's one thing? There's or Oh, comma. there's a comma. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Possibly a semicolon. <laughs> okay. So if we want to get, if we want to get the use, one possibility is licensing. Now, when you license something, is there any CSA involved, any cost sharing agreement involved if there's just a license? Yeah, it's just, it's just a license that says you, you know, uh, B can use and B will pay a royalty. On team agreements that I've worked on, you know, some, some, some people bring the IP and other people bring know-how or specialty. Okay, now you're, okay, that's good. You're talking about something else. So he could bring to the table that they're going to improve the design of the IP. And so in trade, they're giving A partial rights to that improved design, they get the old IP. Yeah. Excellent, excellent point. In the real world, yes, there are real joint ventures between unrelated persons where each side really brings to the table something and you end up with some sort of joint venture where they, uh, in some way, whether through a consortium uh, which, uh, or whether it's through a, an actual legal entity, they, everybody goes forward, let's say, uh, with, with some sort of joint activity or joint project. Why am I distinguishing that from this? You will have, I hope, real transactions where unrelated parties are coming together in consortiums or joint ventures. 
because those are extremely interesting to work on. Why? Because there's real business reasons as to why one is going to put in IP and another is going to put in something else because it really wants access to that IP and the other party wants access to this. Maybe one has uh, a certain IP and another has a sales network or maybe it's in, uh, uh, in a big construction project where uh, one party comes in with certain engineering skills, another party comes in with certain construction knowledge. I mean, in other words, there's a real transaction, there's real things being negotiated. It's not the monkey business that we see inside a control group of corporations. Now, hopefully, like I say, in your careers, whether it's with a law firm, an accounting firm, with a major multinational, you're going to see both types. You're going to experience both types. Uh, whether it's fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not sure, but I think that most of what we have seen in terms of, uh, let's say, tax planning and tax structuring has been on the side of uh, the, what I'll refer to uh, as the monkey business within a group where from a planning perspective, you do have the ability to say, okay, how, you know, on a in a planning sense, how do we structure this? Do we make it a simple licensing agreement? Do we actually have maybe not a licensing agreement, but an actual sale of the IP? Or the third one, do we have some sort of a cost sharing agreement? Now, these are all three different contractual approaches. Under the CSI, I'm sorry, under the CSA, under the cost sharing agreement, yeah, we have two sub questions in a sense. One is that buy in, and number two is. Uh, the future contribution of each part to the annual pool of R&D costs. Now, of course, there's sub-questions on what exactly goes into that sub-pool, you know, how do you calculate, you know, the reasonably anticipated benefits of each party, but, you know, those are going to be computational details. But, but you know, for purposes of our discussion, the big picture is you've got three different contractual ways to deal with this. We know that, okay, and again, just to sort of complete the slide, we said the, do, the two big points underneath the CSA was the buy-in and the, uh, uh, the sharing of the R&D costs. Now, to go back to our picture here, we know that Apple and AOI have a couple of cost sharing agreements in place. Uh, one thing is the buy-in, which presumably happened many, many years ago and is now so long ago that it's sort of out of scope. The second, though, is the share, the sharing of the R&D pool. Now, do you think it's pretty obvious as to what things should go into the sharing of the R&D pool? In other words, what costs are in that R&D pool? A major item of litigation uh, of recent years has been whether equity-based compensation should be part of the R&D pool cost. And that is a major, major item for many of these companies, your Googles and your uh, uh, Facebooks and others uh, are waiting, in a sense, for uh, the judicial system to eventually make a decision on this. So anyway, that's, uh, so that's a, a second thing, uh, which is uh, between them, the, uh, the, the uh, R&D pool sharing.
Well, definitely compensation. So let's say that Kenny here is one of the scientists or a software engineer working on, on something that uh, will create a new product. Okay. Well, he's nodding his head very, uh, very, you know, any, anyway, the, a lot of these companies, a big component of what the employees, you know, hope for in terms of compensation is for stock prices to rise because they're getting stock options or some form of equity-based compensation. This has been very big in a lot of the internet-based companies. So this is not a small item in that pool of uh, R&D costs. It can be a very large number. And what a number of the companies have done is that they exclude that cost from the pool. And as a result, because most of the R&D is done within the U.S. company. The U.S. company has relatively low profitability in comparison with the foreign company because the foreign company isn't bearing its share of some very major cost items. So again, this is something that's now being litigated uh, uh, and uh, uh, is, you know, is quite important. Uh, out there. Okay, there's one more item that we haven't shown up here between A and uh, AOI. What is that item? Uh, well, no, there, there's no payment for use of the license because under the concept of the cost sharing agreement, AOI owns its, uh, its IP for exploitation in its geographic area, which is, let's say, everywhere outside of North America. There's no need for AOI to make any license payments to uh, Apple. The fact that AOI is paying for its share of the R&D costs uh, gives it a partial ownership in the worldwide IP. And that partial ownership is geographically des, uh, defined. So what other item is there? Do you think that people back at Apple are doing anything that helps support AOI's business? Now, when some of you uh, uh, gave the presentation on, uh, on Apple, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, we said that the people who were doing the determination of who we would source components from, negotiations with contract manufacturers, overview of quality or actual conduct of quality control. These things are being done in Cupertino, uh, not somewhere within AOI. Now, does that sound like a service for which Apple should be, uh, Apple should earn a service fee from AOI? What do you think, Kenny? Sorry, could you repeat that? Boy, you're trying to follow on Josh's footsteps. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, Josh, what do you think? I'm giving you a second chance. <laughs> Sorry, I wandered into there. So Yeah, what do you think? Should they pay a service fee? Uh, I mean, would you do something for Kenny free? Or would you expect compensation? Or are you just charitable by nature? No. You're not charitable by nature? Well, get out of here. You just got to pay that loan back. Yeah? What? I thought I answered the question right. Okay, so uh, yeah, well, well repeat it. Yeah. Some sort of yeah, exactly. You expect there to be a service fee. I mean, despite your char real charitable nature, you would not do things free for Kenny. Well, it's the same thing. Apple doesn't do things free for AOI. So as a result, 
there would be a service fee that AOI would pay Apple. There would be some sort of service agreement. Now, uh, who worked on Caterpillar? Do you remember, uh, okay, do you remember a service agreement yeah. that you found cost deep in the, uh, pardon? Cost plus 5%. Yeah, so in the Caterpillar case, that service agreement was cost plus 5%. Uh, I think uh, we're, we're, we're on the transfer pricing uh, section now. Uh, yeah. Does, I mean, if Apple were to use cost plus 5% for managing the entire production process for AOI, do you think that, do you think that five, cost plus 5% sounds a little low? Yes. Yeah, it's it very, sounds, it, it, yeah. So it's the sounds. government contracts that I worked on often were cost plus 12%, but then there's a limit. If the cost goes over a certain amount, then you don't get the 12% on that overtime. Okay. The, yeah, the point, the point is that uh, you're picking up on some real unrelated contracts, whether they're, you know, in terms of similar functions and risks, you know, that's another question, but you've seen some unrelated uh, service contracts and you've seen that, well, gee, the percentages are a bit higher. Uh, now, whether, cost, whether even a cost plus method is appropriate for the kinds of uh, very important functions that people are performing back in Cupertino, well, that's a question. We don't know. We have not seen the Apple AOI or Apple ASI, uh, for those of you who remember the other initials, agreements on who's doing what and how, you know, what they're supposedly doing and what they're getting paid. We haven't seen that. That's not been made public. But this is, uh, this is a transfer pricing question. So to summarize transfer pricing, we, between Apple and the AOI blob, we have uh, identified the, essentially the two parts of the uh, cost sharing agreement. And we've identified the services which are being provided. And we would have to analyze those under the transfer pricing rules. A general question. As I go look forward to your other notes here, you have the word calculate a lot. Well, I'm not suggesting that you specifically calculate. Uh, I, when I was going through and doing this, I was attempting to, in the shortest form possible and least detailed form possible, try to set out some guidance as to how you would apply these things and the order in which you would apply them, uh, at least logically. That's excellent. That's an excellent answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm not expecting you to specifically use this, uh, you know, within this class. The idea was that maybe this would be helpful from your, you know, from your 10,000 feet up looking down and saying, okay, how do these things fit together?